Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of 5 Facts. Today we're going to be talking about the 2000 hit American Psycho. American Psycho is directed by Mary Heron and stars an up-and-coming Christian Bale. It's based on the Bret Easton Ellis novel of the same name. It's a modern classic that was both lauded and panned for its gratuitous violence and captivating characters. There was a lot of controversy whenever they were actually starting up this movie because so many people were against the idea of putting this one on film. Anyway, let's get to the facts. Fact number one, Christian Bale did a lot of method acting for this role. Christian Bale wanted to make this as authentic as possible, so for the entire duration of filming, including when he was offset, including whenever he was actually like out in the world doing his thing, like after hours, he spoke with an American accent. A lot of people didn't know who Christian Bale was before this movie, including people who were on the cast, so whenever they heard him speaking with his English accent, they thought he was actually preparing for another movie at the rap party. Every morning, Bale followed the routine that Patrick Bateman set up. Every layer of moisturizer, every layer of all these different facial creams and hair products and calisthenics and everything, just because he wanted to be as close to Norman Bates as possible. Fact number two. The path to making this film took over eight years and a whole slew of directors and leading people. The film was actually supposed to go to Stuart Gordon originally, the director of Reanimator. He wanted to have this done with Johnny Depp, and they actually had it all figured out for a little while before that fell through. After that, David Cronenberg took over, and he wanted to use a young Brad Pitt to play Patrick Bateman. This version was intensely different from what we ended up getting. It wouldn't have had any scenes in night uh, in nightclubs or in bars uh, or restaurants because Cronenberg simply didn't want to film there. It was a weird requirement. He also had Brett Easton Ellis write this script, and it ended with a musical number on the top of the World Trade Center. It was a very strange movie, and part of me wants to see, but part of me is glad we got what we did. After this, the project was offered to Mary Heron, who went for Christian Bale, but then they got usurped and taken over by Oliver Stone, who wanted Leonardo DiCaprio. Later, it was decided that DiCaprio's audience of 13-year-old girls weren't really the audience for this movie, so they decided to switch it back to Bale and Mary Heron. Fact number three. Huge swaths of dialogue were taken directly from the book. Mary Heron wanted this movie to be as close to the source material as possible. Even though she couldn't go nearly as violent as the book goes, and barely dodged an X rating, she wanted it to feel authentic. This meant she was going to take as many pieces from the book, including actual dialogue, actual narration, and inject it into this movie. Author Brett Easton Ellis actually really approved of this, except for some of the narrations which he felt were a little bit too explicit. He also didn't like the moonwalk uh, when Bateman killed Alan, but that was just a minor gripe. Fact number four. Every shot with Willem Dafoe was shot three different ways. Heron wanted Dafoe to act three specific ways in each scene so that in editing she could change what the audience thought the detective knew about Bateman. First, she wanted him to act as though he was guilty and he absolutely knew that Bateman killed Paul Allen. Second, she wanted him to act like he didn't think he did, that he was innocent, and third, she wanted him to be unsure. She used this tactic to create a sort of unease and tension where sometimes it was buddy-buddy, sometimes it was very much uh, Defoe going directly after Bateman. Fact number five, popcorn facts. I couldn't find a giant fact for this last one, so here's a bunch of short ones. The particular nail gun they chose to nearly kill Chloe Savani was actually a model that required an air compressor and to push uh, the head hard against the surface so that it would unlock the trigger. This simply would not have worked in the position that they were showing it from. Christian Bale modeled most of his performance off of Tom Cruise after seeing him on a late show appearance. He said that there's a very intense friendliness with nothing behind the eyes. So he would take that energy, take that friendliness, and apply it to Patrick Bateman. To avoid an X rating for the movie, they had to cut 18 seconds out. This is mostly uh, during the threesome scene, as well as a few lingering pieces of violence. Those 18 seconds were all they needed to actually make this so that it was rated R. As part of a marketing campaign for this movie, you actually could sign up for emails that were written from Patrick Bateman to his therapist. It was one of the original versions of a major Hollywood movie doing some viral marketing campaigns. Unfortunately, there was a sequel made to this movie, uh, that starred Mila Kunis. She's later said that the movie was entirely a mess and shouldn't have even been American Psycho 2. It was originally a script called The Girl Who Wouldn't Die, and they forced in a Patrick Bateman subplot so that they could try to cash in on the series' name. 
and make it American Psycho 2. Really did not make much sense. American Psycho is as ambiguous as it is interesting. In many ways, it's a satire on the hollowness of greed, of chasing lifestyle based on brands and prestige. It tries to show just how inhuman such pursuits can make a person. Bateman himself claims that he has all the characteristics of being human. Blood, flesh, skin, hair, but not a single clear identifiable emotion, except for greed and disgust. His life has been consumed by the Wall Street lifestyle. He knows the words and he sings along, but it gives him absolutely nothing. It fills him with tumultuous disgust and rage. He has no outlet for this, so he applies the mass daily and tries to conform while fantasizing about incredible violence. On top of that, it could also be the story of a raging psychopathic killer. Once again, we aren't given a clear ending. He could have imagined killing most of these people, and the lawyer just mistook him for, a, for another co-worker, which happens repeatedly, and was the reason why he killed Paul Allen. Or he is so wrapped up in his delusions that he actually believed that he had committed these murders. This is why his confession means nothing. What we are left with either way is a man fraying at the edges, slowly being torn apart by an inability to create human connections, to be something more than a suit rack for the latest designer product. His narcissism is a reflection of his insecurities. He can only be perfect on the surface because there is nothing in his soul other than ash and primordial desires. This film isn't a slow descent into madness. It's a slingshot into the mind of a psychopath, or possibly a schizophrenic with bouts of psychosis. Either way, it is absolutely a film worth your time and consideration. Be prepared to be disgusted, confused, and also enraptured. Do you think he was actually a killer? Do you think it was just a simple mistake? Do you think he did some of the murders and not others? Please tell us in the comments, because this is a movie that really should use some discussion on the end. Also, let me know what you think about the movie overall. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for being part of the Human Echoes Network. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and hit that. Hit like and share this around so that other people can find this channel. We would greatly appreciate it. Otherwise, I hope you guys have an awesome week, and we will see you in two weeks with another movie.